Hello, everyone. This is a uh, kind of unscripted, quick little video I wanted to make in regards to a uh, article that was posted uh, today, I believe, uh, regarding an internal memo that was sent inside of Google over the last couple of days. Uh, this memo comes from a uh, engineering individual in the company, and I'm going to be reading specifically from the Gizmodo posting of uh, the letter itself and the response from the company, and the link to that will be in the description below for your reference. Uh, I'm not going to read the entire uh, memo uh, as posted by this person because it's 10 pages long, but I'm going to cover the sort of the introduction, the TLDR version as the author puts it. Uh, but first, a little background on the story. A software engineer's 10-page screed against Google diversity initiatives is going viral inside the company, being shared on an internal meme network on Google+. The document's existence was first reported by Motherboard, and Gizmodo has obtained it in full. In the memo, which is the personal opinion of a male Google employee and is titled Google's Ideological Echo Chamber, the author argues that women are underrepresented in tech not because they face bias and discrimination in the workplace, but because of inherent psychological differences between men and women. Quote, we need to stop assuming that gender gaps imply sexism, he writes, going on to argue that Google's educational programs for young women may be misguided. The post comes as Google battles a wage discrimination investigation by the U.S. Department of Labor, which has found that Google routinely pays women less than men in comparable roles. So again, I'm going to read the um, sort of the summary version of the letter uh, for your edification. And afterwards, I'm going to read the full memo response from Google's uh, diversity department. And then I will give my uh, comments on that. Reply to public response and misrepresentation. I value diversity and inclusion. I am not denying that sexism exists, and I don't endorse using stereotypes. When addressing the gap in representation in the population, we need to look at population-level differences in distributions. If we can't have an honest discussion about this, then we can never truly solve the problem. Psychological safety is built on mutual respect and acceptance, but unfortunately our culture of shaming and misrepresentation is disrespectful and unaccepting of anyone outside its echo chamber. Despite what the public response seems to have been, I've gotten many personal messages from fellow Googlers expressing their gratitude for bringing up these very important issues, which they agree with, but would never have the courage to say or defend because of our shaming culture and the possibility of being fired. This needs to change. Too long, didn't read. Point number one. Google's political bias has equated the freedom from offense with psychological safety, but shaming into silence is the antithesis of psychological safety. Point number two, this silencing has created an ideological echo chamber where some ideas are too sacred to be honestly discussed. Point number three, the lack of discussion fosters the most extreme and authoritarian elements of this ideology. Extreme, all disparities in representation are due to oppression. Authoritarian, we should discriminate to correct for this oppression. And the final point, Differences in distributions of traits between men and women may in part explain why we don't have 50% representation of women in tech and leadership. Discrimination to reach equal representation is unfair, divisive, and bad for business. So again, that is the high-level sort of summary about what is covered in this 10-page memo. Again, it is a long memo, and I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I encourage everyone to do so on their own time if they can. Now, based on that, this was the response, the official response, from Google's diversity department. It has a longer name, but here we go. Googlers, I'm Danielle, Google's brand new VP of Diversity, Integrity, and Governance. I started just a couple of weeks ago, and I had hoped to take another week or so to get the lay of the land before introducing myself to you all. But given the heated debate we've seen over the past few days, I feel compelled to say a few words. Many of you have read an internal document shared by someone in our engineering organization expressing views on the natural abilities and characteristics of different genders, as well as whether one can speak freely of these things at Google. And like many of you, I found that it advanced incorrect assumptions about gender. 
I'm not going to link to it here as it's not a viewpoint that I or this company endorses, promotes, or encourages. Diversity and inclusion are a fundamental part of our values and the culture we continue to cultivate. We are unequivocal in our belief that diversity and inclusion are critical to our success as a company, and we'll continue to stand for that and be committed to it for the long haul. As Ari Balog said in his internal G Plus post, quote, Building an open, inclusive environment is core to who we are and the right thing to do, Nuff said. Google has taken a strong stand on this issue by releasing its demographic data and creating a company-wide OKR on diversity and inclusion. Strong stands elicit strong reactions. Changing a culture is hard, and it's often uncomfortable, but I firmly believe Google is doing the right thing, and that's why I took this job. Part of building an open, inclusive environment means fostering a culture in which those with alternative views, including different political views, feel safe sharing their opinions. But that discourse needs to work alongside the principles of equal employment found in our code of conduct, policies, and anti-discrimination laws. It's been in the industry for a long time, and I can tell you that I've never worked at a company that has so many platforms for employees to express themselves. TGIF, MemeGen, Internal G+, thousands of discussion groups. I know this conversation doesn't end with my email today. I look forward to continuing to hear your thoughts as I settle in and meet with Googlers across the company. Thanks, Danielle. Okay, here are my thoughts on this, and most specifically from the company's response. Now, if you read the memo, the person writing it is not making arguments against gender or against women. He is saying that there are inherent psychological differences that can be observed in men and women that make women better at some roles and men better at other roles. Not that these things mean they are superior as individuals or as genders, but just that if we see a disparity in who takes what jobs or how jobs are acquired or what promotions are sought after and so on, there's not a gap because of sexism so much as it's a gap of choice. It's a gap of inclination rather than one of discrimination. Now, Google's response is amazing to me because almost in what it is saying by trying to be corporate polite, it is affirming exactly what the author of the memo is accusing the company of doing, creating an echo chamber. Now, the first part that is kind of a red flag to me in this uh, memo, this response memo, is specifically the fact that the author, Danielle, the new VP of Diversity, Integrity, and Governance, while saying that, you know, this is a company where we encourage discussion of viewpoints that are diverse, she's not willing to link the memo itself to her response because. Quote, it's not a viewpoint that I or this company endorses, promotes, or encourages. So rather than provide full disclosure on what she's talking about, rather than allow people to make up their own minds based on the information that she is referring to, she's going to omit that and you know, qualify it as this is not something the company endorses or encourages. So she's not encouraging the message, or she's not encouraging the conversation. She's not encouraging people to make up their own minds. That's a red flag to me. You could see it as a couple of different ways. Sure, she doesn't want to somehow, uh, you know, validate the message by posting it in here. But if you're going to be commenting on it this way, if you're going to be making that assessment of it, then maybe you should provide some context. Maybe you should try to discount what the person is saying rather than just making a blanket statement that it's something we're not going to discuss. That is, well, in a way, passively oppressing the conversation and thus creating an echo chamber. But it's this paragraph in particular that just boggles my mind. And I had to read it twice on the Lords of the Night stream to myself if for no other reason so I could try to get a grasp of what this person is saying. I'm going to read it one more time for reference, and then I'm going to pick it apart. Part of building an open, inclusive environment 
means fostering a culture in which those with alternative views, including different political views, feel safe sharing their opinions. But that discourse needs to work alongside the principles of equal employment found in our code of conduct, policies, and anti-discrimination laws. Now, first off, it's interesting that she's categorizing what this person says, by implication, as a political view. That this person's comments on the differences between the genders psychologically is thus a political standpoint, and not simply one of science or a psychological standpoint, uh, separate from political. It's also interesting that somehow Danielle, the VP of Diversity, Integrity, and Governance, then ties this person's actions Im implicitly as to being somehow in violation of the code of conduct, policies, and anti-discrimination laws. I don't understand exactly how one and the other meet up unless she's accusing this person of somehow violating the code of conduct, the company policies, and the law by writing a 10-page memo which, in very detailed and thoughtful uh, fashion, goes over this person's uh, worries, concerns, and critiques of the company's culture. I don't get that. It seems almost ominous. It seems almost threatening. Now, that's my interpretation. Now, as a general comment, I have made several videos now critiquing corporate promotions and, you know, uh, recitations of their diversity programs. And almost to a one, either implicitly or quite explicitly, companies like Google, like eBay, like Yahoo, put out promotions that say in no uncertain terms, that one of the things that they are working on is trying to make their workforce resemble their customer base or promote diversity in order to get to 50% representation of women in the boardroom in, and so on. Now, what that says to me is somehow they have had to have integrated gender, and racial discriminatory practices into their hiring process. Because when you're talking about your workforce resembling your customer base, when you're talking about trying to achieve 50% gender representation, then you have to be talking about a quota system. You have to be talking about having a filter up front that says, we have two qualified candidates here but one is one way and one is the other way. And if we hire the one person, that makes our numbers look bad towards representation or equal representation. So we're going to hire the other person, not because they're necessarily better, but because of an arbitrary factor like race, like gender, like ethnicity. This is illegal. This is explicitly what the civil rights movement was fighting against you know, racial discrimination in hiring and employment policies. And yet, so many companies, Google included, um, operate under the idea that diversity as a program, as a method, is a good thing, is a virtuous thing, is the right thing to do. Now, the question is always going to be, with this memo and discussions like it, is the author right? Or wrong. It doesn't matter fundamentally. What matters is this person is putting up an opposing viewpoint to what he sees as a regressive system in his company. And he is putting it up in a thoughtful, complete, and very detailed way as to not make it seem like some kind of, you know, irrational screed. And it's been called a screed. But as a screed, it's pretty well thought out and pretty well structured. But Google's not going to have that conversation. Google's not going to entertain the notion that maybe there's something wrong with their policies. Maybe there's something wrong with the culture that they are trying to cultivate 
towards the ends that they state they are trying to reach. They're not willing to do that. They're not willing to repost this person's ideas. They're not willing to discuss them. They're not willing to do anything other than to implicate them as some kind of violation of the law, somehow. And like I say, this is a pattern that we are seeing more and more in corporate culture, as they do everything they can to avoid being called racist or sexist or bigoted against a religion or anything like that. Now, this fear of the accusation that because the numbers of your company do not somehow reflect a utopian ideal, therefore racism, or therefore sexism, or therefore bigotry. The notion that the makeup of a company, or of an institution, or of an industry, is somehow driven by forces other than choice, is seemingly alien to a lot of these companies. They can't seem to entertain the possibility that you know, maybe there's not a lot of women in science because a lot of women aren't choosing to go into science. Or those women that do go into science ultimately decide, I'd like to have a family. The maternal instincts kick in, and the necessities of raising children or having a family or dealing with that kind of stuff takes precedence. Is that sexist? Or is that nature? Is that discrimination? Or is that personal choice? We see this with the wage gap. You see the numbers, the average numbers of money earned by men and women. And there's a differential of, you know, 30% or whatever it was. Therefore, sexism. Not, therefore, women earn less because they make different choices. No, women earn less because patriarchy, because sexism. It's the God of the gaps theory. I present you with something, and then I ask you, how did that get there? And then you fill in the blank with something that makes you feel good, or that makes you sound like a virtuous individual because you know the real answer, whereas the alternative, well, that would say something about the people and not the invisible forces controlling our lives. Anyway, I could go on about this for a long time. I more or less just wanted to point out this situation because I think it is emblematic of a lot of what's going on in corporate cultures these days. Uh, I, like I said, I've done a lot of videos on diversity departments and diversity initiatives and things like that, and have found some very worrying gaps in the logic used when they are implementing these things. So that's all I had to say on that. And so, as always, thank you for listening.